Hello, America, and hello, Alaska. Welcome to Stand, where we help make courage contagious. I'm your host, Kelly Chewbacca, the chair of the Trump campaign and Alaska former U.S. Senate candidate. I'm joined today by my awesome co-host, Nikki Chewbacca, who used to work at the Department of Justice. We're so excited to be with you broadcasting from Alaska's last frontier. You can become one of our, our standouts on our show. You can go to our website, standshow.org, where you can find all of our episodes and make sure to subscribe. Well, strap in tight for an awesome show today. We're going to talk about Israel and Trump with our amazing guest, Alan Dershowitz, who is one of the most celebrated and influential lawyers in the world, I would say. He was the youngest full professor at Harvard Law School, where Nikki and I greatly enjoyed going to some of his lectures when we were students. And he has advised presidents and prime ministers representing many prominent cases, including representing President Trump in his Senate impeachment trial. He's a number one New York Times bestselling author, most recently the book War Against the Jews, How to End Hamas Barbarism. We're going to talk about that book today. So Professor Dershowitz, welcome to Stand. We are so excited to have you with us. I'm thrilled to be there because, you know, I've litigated cases in over 30 states, uh, but I've never been in Alaska. I was supposed to come to speak to the bar a few years ago, but I, I got, had a medical problem, so I canceled it. But my wife and I are thinking about maybe making a trip this uh, uh, late spring or early summer to Alaska because it's, I think, the only state I've never been to. And I'm anxious to go there. I hear it's absolutely beautiful and the people are fantastic. And I've had a number of former students who have been there, including members of the judiciary. And so I'm really looking forward to uniting with some of my former students and seeing the beauty of Alaska. You're welcome to come. We'd be happy to have you as former students. We'd be so happy to have you here. We'll show you a great time. You'd be definitely welcome in Alaska. Yeah, you would love it. So you're a prominent Democrat, kind of a little bit of a different flavor of Democrats. But something that I found interesting you've said is that you will never speak to President Obama again. I think that that's interesting. I'd love for you to share with us a little bit more about why. Well, I knew Obama as a student. I knew him as Barry. Um, and he used to hang out with my closest friend on the faculty, Charles Ogletree. And uh, he used to hang out in front of the office and we shared an, an office area. So I got to talk to Barry numerous times and I really liked him. He always came to the office wearing a leather jacket with a cigarette dangling out of his mouth and, um, and alternating between talking Harvard style and talking uh, black style. Uh, and it would depend who he was talking to. So I, I always wondered about his authenticity, but I supported him uh, when he ran the first time. And I was having some doubts about the second time. And he called me and I was in Israel. And he asked me what people in Israel were talking about. And I said, Iran, et cetera. And he said, well, come to the Oval Office when you come back to the United States. And so I did. And we had a considerably long time conversation. Obviously, he was asking for me to endorse him um, for the second term. And uh, he wanted to assure me that he had Israel's back. And he kept saying over and over again, you know me, I'm a man of my word. I will never abandon Israel. Um, I will never accept an Iran deal that doesn't guarantee that they will never get nuclear weapons. And so I foolishly endorsed him. I wish I hadn't. If I had it to take over again, I would vote for Mitt Romney, who would have been a better president and was a great governor, I thought, of, um, of Massachusetts. But uh, and then when at the last week of his term, last couple of weeks of his term, he did not veto over the objection of his own U.N. representative and other people in the State Department. He allowed a resolution to be passed for the Security Council that said that the Western Wall, the holiest place of Judaism, equivalent to the Vatican and Catholicism or or Salt Lake City to Mormonism, that the Western Wall is illegally occupied territory. He allowed the United States to vote for that and that the access roads to Hebrew University and the Hadassah Hospital are all illegally occupied territory. And that, for me, uh, showed mm. that he was either he was lying to me or he had changed his mind because he was really out to get Netanyahu. Uh, this was his last month in office and he was going to get revenge. This was not in the interest of the United States. It was not American policy. It was just Barack Obama being nasty and, and hurting uh, Israel and hurting American interests in the Middle East. And I thought it was such a, uh, uh, a show of uh, a personal peak 
that it terminated my relationship with him. I had a very good relationship with him. I was invited to the White House repeatedly during his eight years. Uh, I was one of the only people outside of government invited to see him give the award uh, Medal of Honor to um, Shimon Perez. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, he wrote me a beautiful note on my 75th birthday. But once this happened, you know, I pick my friends carefully. And so uh, I, I am uh, I am not a friend of Barack Obama. And I hope his wife, um, uh, Michelle, who I remember also as a student, I hope she does not run for president. I really appreciate you sharing that. That's good insight. That leads us, I think, naturally into a discussion about this latest book that you've written, The War Against the Jews. I want to jump into that. Israel left the Gaza Strip in 2005. It's offered to give land of its own to Palestine many times in order to end the conflict, but every time it has Palestine and the Palestinian leaders have rejected that compromise deal. They don't want a two-state solution, it seems. So what's your take on how to end this conflict and stop Hamas barbarism, as you've proposed? Well, there's a story in today's um, um, media in Israel, but not in the United States, that Sinwa, the head of the uh, Hamas, has said he doesn't want a ceasefire. He does not want a ceasefire. He wants to escalate. He wants to see more Palestinian civilians in Gaza killed. He thinks that will be good for Hamas's cause. And he thinks that if we don't have a ceasefire uh, during Ramadan, that will increase uh, the violence and increase the death rate. And Hamas benefits every time a civilian is killed. If they kill an Israeli civilian, they benefit. If Israel kills by accident, because they don't try to do it, a Palestinian civilian, Hamas benefits. And everybody should read this article. I posted it online uh, in, in my uh, uh, Twitter account. The article is amazing because it, it really quotes Sinwa, the head of Hamas, saying he's now changed his mind. He doesn't want to cease fire. So all these useful idiots who are protesting, yesterday they protested um, in California, um, at the at the election results, uh, when with Adam Schiff, they were screaming ceasefire, ceasefire. Well, scream that to Hamas. Israel has offered a, a ceasefire, uh, and Hamas says no because Sinwa and Hamas want dead Palestinians, preferably babies. The more dead babies that they can show on television, the stronger their cause. This is so cynical. And CNN plays into it. MSNBC plays into it. The New York Times plays into it. But the American public is too smart for that. And they understand the cynicism of Hamas, that Hamas's goal is dead babies in order to put the onus on Israel. There's nothing more cynical than that. I asked the head of the palace, one of the heads of the Palestinian group, when I debated him uh, uh, recently um, uh, on uh uh, uh, a television show, I said, will you stand up to Hamas and say, do not use human shields? This is on Pierce mm -hmm. Morgan. And this leading Palestinian said, Hamas does not use human shields. Well, I have a videotape of one of the leaders of Hamas bragging about how we use our children and our women as human shields. They are martyrs. We're proud of them. They're human shields, human shields. This is not my term. This is Hamas's term. And yet the leaders of the Palestinian Authority think they can pull the wool over the eyes of decent Americans by saying Hamas doesn't use human shields. They're also now saying many feminists are now saying, well, Hamas didn't rape anybody. If anybody was raped, it was probably the Israeli Defense Forces who, who raped them. This kind of rape denial is kind of rich, small Holocaust denial. You know, extremists say, oh, the Holocaust didn't occur. But now you get these people, there are tapes, there are recordings, there are testimonies, there are photographs of women raped, being raped, and, and you see the results. And me too, me too, except if you're a Jew. And so I am okay. no longer like a supporter of the Me Too movement. I am not a supporter of gays for Palestine. If you want to be a gay for Palestine, buy a one-way ticket to Gaza. Go to Gaza. And you'll never get out. You'll be killed. You'll be thrown off a roof if you're a gay for Gaza. But they're so hate. The hatred of Israel and Jews is so deep that they're willing to subordinate their own cause of gay rights to 
the anti-Israel attitudes that they have. Is there any hope for stopping it? Is there any solution? Yeah, the same solution that won us the Second World War. Total, unequivocal victory and surrender. Hamas has to be destroyed. You know, the Secretary of Defense made the classic mistake. He said, oh, if you attack Gaza, you'll just create more and more terrorists. No. What happened after the Second World War? We demolished Germany. We killed so many Germans. We demolished Japan. We dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. What happened? Germany and Japan became our strongest allies. They understood mm -hmm. we were strong and their leaders had produced disaster. And I think if Israel totally destroys Hamas, the people of Gaza will be thankful and say, mm -hmm. thank you, Israel for taking these tyrants away from us and bringing us a prospect possibly of a democracy. That's a good point. Palestinians and Hamas are two different groups of people. We're coming up on a break. We'll be right back with Professor Alan Dershowitz on all things Israel and 2024 elections with President Trump. Stay with us. You're on stand with Kelly Nikichibaka and Professor Alan Dershowitz. We'll be right back after this break. Stand tuned. Hello, America. Hello, Alaska. Welcome back to Stand. We are with the great Professor Alan Dershowitz. Uh, who has now written 55 books, 55 books all. So we've got a lot of reading to do. There's a lot of wisdom. Um, and he's written on, a, written on a, a breadth of subjects. But right now we are, we're talking about uh, Israel and uh, the, the war there that's uh, affecting uh, the entire world. Um, and his book, War Against the Jews, he's holding it up, How to End Hamas Barbarism. Encourage everybody to pick it up. Uh, we're going to post um, a link to it on our uh, Facebook page so you can all easily uh, get a hold of it. But I uh, wanted to follow up with you, Professor Dershowitz. You were, you were talking about um, sort of the, the, the maybe even willful ignorance of the media in terms of how they're, they're talking about what's happening um, in Israel. Uh, we, we're seeing just the what happens when anti-Semitism runs amok. Um, and here in our country, I think many of us have been shocked um, at the level of anti-Semitism that has sort of bubbled up to the surface um, concurrently with this with this conflict. Uh, the conflict. How do you, how have you processed that? I mean, it's 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 scary to me, uh, and I'm not even Jewish, uh, but it it terrifies me to see what's been happening on our campuses, what professors have been you know, inculcating in the minds of our young people, how our young people have been responding, even how the media has responded with some, uh, some, some anti-Semitic um, tropes and, and remarks. How do you process that uh, and respond to that as a, uh, as a Jew in America? Well, first of all, I want to thank Alaska, which has been one of the better states on this issue, and the universities and the people there. The people of Alaska are su such decent people, and it's not a place of hatred. Uh, the way some places uh, are. Uh, there's one, one institution that's to blame more than any other in the world, and, and it's called uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the DEI bureaucracy that is now sprouting its ugly head all over university campuses. And the object of DEI is to avoid meritocracy, never to, never to uh, allow people to thrive on their own success, but everything becomes identity politics. And it's part of what's called intersectionality, which divides the world into two groups. Um, if you're white, Christian, uh, Jewish, uh, you are an oppressor. And if you're a person of color, no matter how wealthy you are, and no matter how your parents may have participated in oppressing others, or you have, uh, you're the oppressed. And so teaching this nonsense uh, permeates now American universities, American corporations, the American uh, media, and it, it has resulted in, for example, uh, Jews now are being turned away at major American universities when they apply, even if they have higher grades, along with many Asian Americans. And there was a lawsuit in the Supreme Court that I supported against my own university, uh, Harvard. And so I think it's young people who are the villains, just the way they were in producing Nazism. Nazism is the product of young people at the University of Munich, the University of Berlin. Communism was stirred on uh, not only in, in Moscow by young people, but in Cuba 
um, with with Castro, Mao Zedong, uh, Pol Pot, all were adored by young radical zealots. And that's happening in America today. These useful idiots, including people whose children I know, uh, and, and, and they're marching. Uh, you know, uh, I'm writing a new book in which I'm tentatively entitled it, Palestinian Pied Pipers are leading your children from, from the river to the sea. And they're going to drown. Uh, they're going to drown in their absurdity. And so we have to fight back. And I wish I'm 85 years old and it's not easy for me to fight back physically. So I continue to write books. And uh, uh, my newest book, uh, War on Woke, uh, which isn't out yet. I just got the first copy of it, but also goes after the woke culture. Woke is inconsistent with civil liberties, human rights, basic dignity, and Americanism. You can't be both woke and a, and a decent American. This woke, woke defies everything that America stands for. America thrives on meritocracy. We judge you, as Martin Luther King said, I was there when he made this speech in August of 1963, where he said, I have a dream that someday my children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of that character. And DEI says, no, we don't want you to be judged by individual content of your character. We want you to be judged only by the color of your skin or by your ethnicity or by your sexual preference. Uh, and if you're oppressed, we're on your side. And if you're oppressor, we're against you. That's the major problem. It's destroying America. And we have to fight back. And thank you, Alaska, for being on the right side generally of this issue. Hmm. Yeah, that's that was so powerfully stated, and it it resonates so much with with us because uh, you know we have obviously biracial children, and you know talking to our own uh, our oldest uh, two, we have five kids, and our oldest two who are uh, young adults slash late teens, you know asking us with all this DEI stuff, well, am I a, am I a victim or am, or am I an oppressor? Should I love you, dad, and hate mom? Like how does how does this work? And and so just the, the the psychological damage, the emotional damage that that can do to the identity and um, and the the sense of self for our children uh, that this DEI stuff um, is doing. It's just it's just horrible. Um, I'm grateful that our kids have a good sense of who they are and what they believe. But if they didn't, um, it would be so destructive. And um, too many have that sense. They depend on others outside to give them a kind of talking points and then they fall into this trap and it can destroy their lives. I've seen some young people's lives destroyed by this uh, woke uh, demand that everything be judged by oppressor or oppressed. Yeah, yeah. If, if I could just pivot for a second, um, we are in election season and you, you have been doing some phenomenal commentary um, on what we've, what we've, all been witnessing in terms of the weaponization of uh, of our government, whether it's law enforcement, the judiciary, and it, you know it's been there on some level, you know, for a while, but it, it's exploded in ways that are completely unprecedented um, with uh, Donald Trump's presidency and, and and since then. And part of what concerns me about it, there's the macro level, obviously, of what this portends for the future of politics and public service uh, in our country, our freedoms. Uh, but I'm also thinking about uh, the young or new lawyers who are this next generation, this next crop of lawyers who are coming up in the context of all of this. Uh, Professor Dershowitz, you have you have trained the minds and, um, and uh, the convictions and the principles of generations of attorneys, uh, thousands of attorneys over the years. You've shaped their minds, you've helped develop their principles, and you've always been consistent about, in terms of your approach to the law um, and your approach to, you know, to, to the principles that undergird our Constitution. What do, we, what do we do with this next generation? Like, how do we make sure they don't get all caught up in all of this? No way of making sure, and I haven't always been successful. One of my students was Jamie Raskin. He took my class in criminal law. And now he is trying to turn the Constitution against democracy. He made a statement after the Supreme Court wrote its decision nine to nothing, saying that Colorado couldn't ban Trump uh, off the ballot. Reskin says, well, yes, we can. Uh, we're going to get him off the ballot. We'll figure out a way of manipulating the Constitution uh, and, and we'll get him off the ballot in the name of democracy. 
Um, and a lot of professors at Harvard uh, support that. Uh, the one thing that being a Harvard professor doesn't give you is courage. And uh, people are so concerned. You have tenure, you'd think you can speak your mind, which I've been doing for 60 years, but most of my colleagues on the Harvard faculty refuse to speak their mind. They, their minds are designed to achieve popularity among the students. And, um, and uh, they just go with the flow and they uh, insist on wokeness. And so I think we're going in the wrong direction. And I think the new McCarthyism that we're experiencing could, can easily become the new Americanism. We are seeing the misuse of our legal system, the weaponization of our legal system, uh, the five cases against Donald Trump, four criminal, one civil, are all weak and would never have been brought if he weren't running for uh, president. The New York case, which is going to be the first one tried, is, I think, the weakest criminal case I've seen in 60 years of practice. The Georgia falling apart because the prosecutor may very well have committed perjury, obstruction of justice, witness tampering. You know, she ought to be in the box. Uh, and I think the same thing is going to be true for some of these other cases as well. But the goal of prosecutors, again, is to deny voters the right to select their candidates without regard to uh, legal issues. Courts are playing and prosecutors are playing too great a role today in who we vote for. We, the people, decide who the next president is. I plan at the moment to vote uh, Democrat. I'm not, by the way, a loyal Democrat. I have voted Republican on occasion. I will vote Republican when I think the Republican candidate is better than the Democratic candidate. But um, uh, at the moment, I, I do not plan to vote for Donald Trump, but I plan to continue to defend his legal rights, his constitutional rights, his civil liberties, because once you take it away from anybody, you take it away from everybody. And it can be used today against Trump, tomorrow against you, the next day against me. And and we have to fight that. I appreciate yeah. you saying that. I've loved how you consistently say, if you take it away from civil liberties and constitutional rights away from one person, then you take it away from everybody. It's been a great interview. Thank you so much for your time. Professor Dershowitz has been with us on stand. With Kelly Nikki Chewbacca. Stay with us after the break. We'll continue our discussion following up on what Professor Dershowitz said. Make sure to get his book, War Against the Jews. You can find it on Amazon, anywhere books are sold. It's fantastic. We so much appreciate you being with us today. We'll be with you right after the break. Thanks so much. You're back on stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. We just finished an amazing interview with Alan Dershowitz, professor at Harvard Law School and author of dozens of great books, including his most recent one, War Against the Jews. You can pick it up on Amazon. We got to talk with him about all things in Israel and about these upcoming 2024 elections. Nikki, I wanted to follow up with you on something I thought was super interesting that he said. So he commented that he has this ability to defend, literally defend President Trump, and to recognize that all these cases that are against him right now have no basis in law, but that he'll be voting Democrat in 2024. I really admire that Dershowitz has the ability to see when somebody's rights are being violated, someone who he doesn't agree with politically, but he can still defend that person and advocate for that person on national TV, and yet um, vote for somebody different, say, I don't politically align. His identity is not wrapped up in it. Why do you think that so many Americans have a hard time doing that? There's this whole Trump derangement syndrome that we keep hearing about where people are so angry, like um, vitriolically angry about President Trump that they destroy friendships over it and uh, get so worked up, you know, never Trumpers and can't say anything positive or, or see things clearly to even, to even acknowledge the decline of the American judicial system or the weaponization of our law enforcement systems against somebody that actually affects every American regardless of political position. Why can't more Americans see things like Alan Dershowitz with an apolitical lens when it comes to constitutional rights and civil liberties and instead are so politically divided? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I, I don't know that I have the answer to it. I have thoughts on it. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think part of it is that we, uh, we have a, a younger generation coming up that hasn't 
been taught a lot about thinking critically for themselves. there's been a lot of indoctrination. i mean, we see it with our kids in school you know, the things that they're being taught k through twelve and then you know our own kid in university. and um when there's a lot of indoctrination indoctrination and not a lot of critical thinking when you're being told what to think, not how to think or. such a good point. or why you should come to why you should believe what you what you do when you're not placed in an environment where it's safe for people to have views that are perhaps controversial and be able to talk about them then then you have an issue with you know people later on being able to like you know connect and and dialogue on things that are that they that they're passionate about in a way that's that's healthy and constructive i also think that there's on some level we're dealing with sort of high school writ large in a way that the social pressure that that people experience in whether it's in a professional environment whether it's the bombardment from you know from the media social media you know everybody wants to feel like they're they're a good person um we all do and and so nobody wants to be on the wrong side right of a particular political issue and so i think it just it it causes us to draw the battle lines a lot more um starkly and we get caught in a zero sum you know debate as a result but having these dialogues with people like professor dershowitz who you know we have our political differences with him but we also agree with him on the fundamentals which is what as americans should be uniting all of us right to your point on the fundamentals like everybody should be entitled to to process nobody should be prosecuted and gone after because of their political positions and because of what they believe and we all know that's what's happening with president trump i don't know why people actually think that that this that's being done to him is is just going to be sort of a a one-off and would 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 never happen again i think there's on some level we're we're choosing to be a little bit naive about it and thinking well in in just this one case you know the ends justify the means and that's just sounds a lot like 1933 it's never true in politics it's never true once you open that pandora's box Mm -hmm. it's you know it's it's done and so uh i still think we have hope like we can still rein this in i think the uh, the Supreme Court has, has 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 done that with the decision that it it, it rendered recently on. Um, yeah, nine people with very different political views and jurisprudence, very different right. ways of reading the Constitution, all agree mm-hmm. this has gone too far. Right, and I think those kinds of things will help to sort of cabin us in a little bit as a country and remind us, hey, no, this is who we are, not not this other stuff, mm-hmm. like. We are a people who agree on these fundamental values and we are not going to sacrifice those values for what we perceive in as a short short term gain whether we're republicans or democrats independents socialists whatever political stripe we 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 may be whatever religious affiliation we may have whatever economic status we may be in that's not that's not what we do um I really like your analogy of the lunchroom Mm-hmm. or the high school uh, analogy because it reminds me of a high school lunchroom where everyone kind of based their identity on where you sit at lunch right yeah. and so well you sit with this table that table and you kind of get into this tribalism concept instead of thinking about why you ever sat at the table to begin with yeah. and we also maybe remember if you can brush off your high school memory um there were times you switched tables because of either a change in the friend group or a change in your circumstance and that that's still an option that you can you can be open enough like Dershowitz would pick up his tray and go sit at Trump's table to figure out how to defend him that doesn't mean that that's who he's voting for for student body president but he can he's savvy enough to be able to sit at a lot of different tables in the lunchroom that it doesn't have to be your social identity your lunchroom table doesn't have to become your school identity and i think that that's part of what we've fallen into is just a lot of hyper tribalism instead of identifying ourselves by values it reminds me of a conversation i've been having a lot with the kids who are saying you know okay mom so cuz especially with primary season and everything that came up um are we republican and i was like whoa hold up on that i say you know um those are really loose terms because if we look back through history of america 
the values of the Republicans and the values of the Democrats have really changed on us. And we just need to be very careful. I don't want to ingrain in our kids that we are sit at this lunchroom table. Because if the values of the Republicans change significantly over the course of those kids' lifetime, I don't want them saying, well, mom said to sit at this table. And then it turns out that the party is actually standing for and advocating for things that we never actually believe. Mm -hmm. It really comes down to, like you're saying, um, how do you think? What, what are those paradigms and those values by which you believe? And it turns out we actually have a lot more in common with people who might call themselves by a different party or even call themselves by a non-party. And that's what can unify the country. If you can actually move past, you, you're probably not going to agree with everybody on much. You and I don't agree on everything politically. That's okay. I'm not looking for assimilation. And I'm not looking for people to say, oh, you have to completely agree, you know, the indoctrination. We're looking for uh, unity and affinity. And that's what, you know, kind of these, that's why you have a party platform, these platform points. Can we agree on these principles, how we think about things? Because when it comes to forming policy and making decisions, you have to run a proposed legislation or am I going to support a candidate through a set of values? I think we've gotten away from what are those values that we really advocate, you know, as a country, what unifies us. There's people out there, even people in elected positions right now at the national level who are, who are espousing non-American values. They just absolutely go against our Constitution. And as Dershowitz said, leaders in our country who are now really advocating and promoting fundamentally un-American values, using our, our American systems to push un-American values. And we've got to be united around some basic principles here. Do we or do we not support free speech? Do we or do we not, let's just back it up, support mm -hmm. freedom? Mm -hmm. Do we or do we not support truth? Just like basic truth. And if we do support those things, then it has to be for everybody. And everybody. not just everybody except this one person here who we think is <laughs> who a we danger, disagree or with. who we disagree with right. or who we don't like. Um, that's, how, that's how democracies get upended. That's, That's correct. Gets. Well, speaking of democracy, do we or do we not support a government led by the people instead of the government led by unelected bureaucrats who unilaterally decide this person's not going to be on the ballot or a government led by a judicial system with no accountability or a government led by a weaponized um, law enforcement system? This is becoming very scary un-American stuff that we really need to guard against. And, and we were faced with this last year, an, an interesting decision that kind of came to our doorstep. Whose job is it to guard against those things? There's no nonprofit organization swooping in to save you. There's no police force that's going to swoop in when they, when they come for your constitutional rights. No police force is coming in to swoop in to save you. The media is not going to go, hey, wait, you know, your constitutional rights are being violated. It fundamentally comes to each individual American to, 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 to take, a, take a stand. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> take a stand and to say, uh, I'm going to defend my constitutional rights against what is an erosion by the government right now. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so important in this time. And that's what Alan Dershowitz has done, you know, throughout his career. Uh, he's been one of those uh, paragons of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, one of one of those examples of what it what it looks like to be consistent, whether you agree with the legal positions he's taken or not. That's a totally different issue, but he's been consistent in what he believes the Constitution says, how he believes it should be applied. Right. And he he and that's what he's taught. You know, his students. That's what he's advocated for. Right. Um. And and I think that's what's also enabled him to. You know, you opened up the segment with that, with that question, you know, how he's been able to say, I'm not going to vote for Trump, but I am going to defend him uh, and his, his constitutional rights. Because if I don't, to the extent I, I mean, he didn't say this, but this was this is the, the underlying principle. To the extent I say, I'm going to let um, this person get attacked on this issue and say it's okay, then I'm, I'm sort of undermining my rights as well. Because right. I'm basically giving other people the justification to do the same. Yeah. For Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca on stand, we'll be right back after this break.
Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. So glad to have you with us. We hope you hit subscribe while you were on break. Caught all of our episodes at standshow.org. Well, we've been talking about our interview with Alan Dershowitz. Something I think is interesting is in his book, War Against the Jews, which we were talking about, he makes the point that this particular conflict that's happened has created, it's by bringing to light some of the hidden um, feelings that people have in America. So surprising anti-Semitism and surprising support that it has blended lines or blurred lines of um, advocacy and enemies that weren't there before. So people who previously would have found themselves political opponents are now political allies and vice versa. He makes that point. And that it has caused some interesting disruptions for the 2024 election. And we've already seen that, like in the the primaries, especially in March primaries, we saw a lot of, um, on the Democrat side, uh, undecided or un, you know, uncommitted uh, votes of people who actually were really disappointed, Democrats who were really disappointed that the Biden administration hasn't been more supportive of Hamas and Palestinians. And so they're against Biden. They're, they're just not going to vote for Biden. And then similarly, people who identify themselves as Democrats being really upset that um, some of the left has taken such a strong pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas position that they find themselves distancing from the Democrat Party and Democrat leadership and are reluctant to vote for the Democrat administration and are either going to vote Republican or unsure or just not going to vote, which could really affect voter turnout. I think that this, so I want to chat with you about it and get your, your take, but I think that this presents a unique opportunity. So this isn't something that is kind of contrived by the media or a force by nonprofit groups in America. It sort of popped up, you know, from a, a provoked conflict from Hamas last October. Um, and America's responding. So uh, a little bit like Arab Spring that happened, you know, many years ago that our intelligence community didn't anticipate. I think this is something America didn't anticipate. The American indoctrination machine, if you will, didn't anticipate. That suddenly has made strange bedfellows, political bedfellows across the country, and left us in a place that um, provides opportunity for unity, just like we were talking about in our last episode, where there's been dialogue and discussion and, and people looking at each other differently going, I, I didn't expect to find myself on, in the same camp as you, but this is actually a really big issue. This issue of what happens between Israel and Palestine, actually Israel and Iran, Israel and the entire Middle East, it affects an entire global stability. It affects our relationship with the Middle East, but it affects entire global stability. And what you think about this conflict and about these people groups um, has tremendous consequences. You know, when you see these pro-Palestinian supporters in New York and such holding up Nazi flags, it affects, like, we're talking about how you think about things, not just what you think. Um, I think most people, we have to say most because it isn't all, most people want peace in the Middle East and want this conflict to stop. We, we want um, innocent people to stop dying. We want there to be peace. However, we can't support people holding up and, and espousing Nazi ideology, right? So I like that this is an opportunity for there to be unity between people groups that didn't used to find unity and commonality. What yeah. are your, what's well, your take? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you say that it's made strange bedfellows because it really shouldn't have. I mean, we have, That's a great point. We have for so many decades had a consistent pro-Israel... Wait, pro please define we, because the people listening might not When know. I say we, I say we as a country. I see. Um, have had a, a, a pro, generally pro-Israel stance. Now, we, Democrats and Republicans have had differences of opinion on, on and in, in terms of their administrations, presidential administrations, on how to achieve a two-state solution and those kinds of things. But uh, America has been, um, as a matter of policy, um, at the, the highest levels of government, a 
staunchly pro-Israel. And so to see that kind of become upended, even though our current President Biden has spoken from the bully pulpit and said, you know, we support Israel, there's also been a lot of underhanded things, you know, on the other hand, that go where he hasn't. So it's a very strange irony to me that in 2001, we had 9-11. And it was a bunch of terrorists who flew a plane into a building, killed... Yeah, a couple of buildings. Yeah, killed hundreds of Americans, right? Thousands. And our response was... A war on terror. A war on terror. We went into Iraq. We invaded a country. We occupied a country, right? And, I mean, we went all out. Now... For years. Now, we are in a position where we have people in government, our leaders, speaking in support of a terrorist organization. That's correct. And defending a terrorist... In their terrorist acts. And criticizing Israel for doing very much the same thing that we did when we invaded Iraq, right? And so, for me, it's just, it's the cognitive dissonance between saying we are, you know, having this strong war on terror, and then on the other hand, having leaders now saying, we are standing with this terrorist organization because, and against Israel in this conflict, is just mind-boggling to me. It's mind-blowing. Even as the heads of the terrorist organization are saying, we do not want a ceasefire. And that's why, and to your point, that's why I think we're seeing a coalescing of people who, on lots of other issues, might be on like polar opposites. Mm-hmm. When they see that kind of double-mindedness, when they see that kind of hypocrisy, when that's they're like, you know, no, no, we're not, we're not with you on that one. We're united on this particular piece, and it's an important thing to be united on. Let's 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 that's you know, right. let's be very clear. It's important to be united on our support for Israel, and supporting Israel does not mean being against Palestine, which is often also how it's <laughs> how it's framed. Um, it's being against the organization, the government leadership that's that's leading them, Hamas, which is a terrorist organization. But you're not against Palestinians by supporting Israel. Israel does a lot um, to support and, and help uh, Palestinians. There, 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 there are Arabs in in, um, in Israeli Parliament too. I mean, it's it's not a um, um, it's not a situation where. It's this again another zero sum you know issue where you have to like saying one thing means that you're against the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think America has supported and has tried to broker that two state solution multiple times. I think there's been several times it's been offered that Israel's offered it even in this century, and Palestinian leadership has rejected it. And you know even this song that they sing or the the motto they have from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Um, free of what? And the answer is free of Israel. And so that's why they, they've been rejecting this two-state solution, because the, they don't want Israel between the sea and the Jordan River, which means getting rid of the state of Israel. And I think on our end, it's so critical that we as Americans continue to speak out, I mean, uh, in addition to what's happening there, but to speak out very strongly against what we're seeing in terms of this rise of anti-Semitism. Yes. Because, you know, you and I know, for example, our, there, there's not a lot, at least in terms of what our children have been taught, school, we had to teach them about. World War II, about they World never War were II, taught Hitler, about the Holocaust. The Holocaust, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's important that we remind this, you know, the, the, the generations that are following us of what can happen and not to think that we're somehow morally superior and so much yeah, better point. than these other, like, we are all human. We are all capable of the greatest um, heroisms and amazing things, but we're also capable of the most horrible depravity. Right. And we need to remember the lessons of history and remind ourselves of them. And when we see things like the anti-Semitism that we're seeing, you know, bubble up, not to be silent and to really stand strongly against it and speak loudly 
against it because we don't we don't we don't want to go down that dark and dangerous road yeah that's exactly right i think that that's good so what do you think this means for the 2024 election i think uh i think this could really have a big effect on democrat turnout uh, i think that this might be part of why we're seeing a surge in republican favoritism for president trump i think that could be contributing to it i think it it could have a surprising impact on what happens in 2024 what's your take yeah i mean i i think the the biggest right now the biggest issue is immigration i think that's going to have the biggest impact but i do think uh this issue with what's happening in israel and uh the anti-Semitism we're seeing, and, and perhaps the Dershowitz tied it also with DEI, like it's all of a piece, this kind of racist uh, tribalism ideology that's, sure. um, people don't like it, and they've seen the damage that it's done in just a few years, so I, I do think it's going to play a role in the election. Um, I do think that, that uh, foreign policy is an important issue. Uh, I just think that Domestic, really, right now, that's that's probably going to be Top the, of people's you know, minds. the bigger thing. Yeah, um, I got to say though, I really enjoyed uh, Professor Dershowitz's passion, his his staple eloquence, um, yeah, and his wisdom. Yeah, you know, it was a great interview. Great interview. Thanks so much for being with us today on Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. You can catch all of our episodes at standshow.org. We'd love for you to subscribe, and we'll see you next week.